The life we lead is made by the choices we make. Sometimes we have no influence over those choices. Who is the master of my journey? Am I it? Can I see the future based on memories of the past? Memories of events that have led me to this present moment. A moment that is uncertain because so much is changing. The life I lead is affected by the choices made by those that have dominion over this place, land, planet. But where do I belong? What will my place become? I'm on the periphery, often seen, seldom noticed. I am the dog and you are my master. Africanus is the general name for all of the South African indigenous dogs. It refers to Africa, the continent, and Canis, the dog. Over the centuries, the Africanus dog has been shaped by Africa for Africa. They have become a perfect product of their environment. Their African heritage goes back some 7,000 years to the dogs that traveled with the Neolithic herdsmen from the Middle East into what was then virgin territory for dogs on the continent of Africa. Today, Africanus is found in the tribal areas all over Southern Africa. One woman in particular who has taken a great interest in the Africanus as a land race is Edith Gallant, who along with her husband, Jahan, have been instrumental in establishing the Africanus Society. Both Jahan and Edith have been involved with dogs for most of their lives. We had been around in the rural areas, Johan and I, for uh, investigating these dogs. We were curious. We had been in purebred dogs before, and this dog started to, fascinating, uh, to fascinate us. And so we said, yeah, and we went into the rural area and saw these dogs with the traditional people and the traditional hunting and the way they behave around the homestead. And it started fascinating us. We had a group of people who were sort of very keen to make the awareness to what they, these dogs were existing because they all thought, well, they were just, you know, little mongrels hanging around there and with no, no reason to be there, really. The African is, is not a breed. It is what we call a land trace. What is the difference between a land trace and a breed? A breed is artificially selected for certain height, size, color. And most of our breeds of today, or modern breeds, only exist for 150 years. These dogs have been with humans for thousands of years. And why a land trace? Because these dogs only exist around the rural areas with the traditional people and there is no selection have been done for these dogs they they live in nature they breed in nature it's natural selection is the survival of the fittest it's not because they look red or brown or striped or with standing ears or with floppy ears or with a curly tail that the ones are africanis what we have named them but they are land traces because nobody has selected them for a certain look. I once watched you from a distance until a primal need drove me towards you. I am a product of this African environment. I am strong. I have survived. I came to you subservient. This was my nature. You understood my place. Our bond was once so strong it could only be felt from the heart. This dog's natural aptitude is exceptional. It almost seems intuitive. Edith has conducted aptitude tests on her Africanus dogs and found that they excel, even more so than some of her purebred dogs. The natural behavior, what that test looks for, they still have it, what our purebred dogs don't have. It's an amazing test. We've done it for purebred dogs for so many years, and we could see what purebred dogs have been, what lacking, what is not there anymore. There's no correct response anymore, and they're just the natural environment, the lateral instincts is unbelievable. Most of our purebred dogs, even if they end up in the rural areas, 
what chance of survival have they? This, our Aboriginal dogs, the, the land races, have survived ticks, worms. They never have been dewormed. They have never been inoculated, and they survive. Our modern breeds have always been inoculated, dewormed, injected. So the resistance to disease in our modern breeds is so uh, little. You know, they come in the rural areas where they don't get the proper food, they don't get a luxury food. Uh, so the, the chance of, let's say even if that dog, now that bordered collie breeds with a land trace, they might have a litter of puppies. How many of these puppies will survive? Very few. Uh, don't forget that even today, most of our rural black people, indigenous people, don't eat meat every day. It's a luxury. Meat is still, you know, uh, exceptional for certain circumstances or for certain ceremonies. So the dogs get the scraps. They would get the left of the pot of the putu, and of course the rat and whatever they can scavenge. Dylan Harvey has lived in the Transkai with his family for many years. He owns a retreat way off the beaten track. And because of this remoteness, he has developed close relationships with the local community. Needless to say, as with most locals, he has some interesting insights into this land race. But they are, they're almost like a cockroach. They don't need to be dipped, from what I've seen. They don't have any vaccinations or anything. They're, they only weigh about 15 kgs at the most, or even 10. Traditionally, these dogs have been able to fend off ticks and diseases, but recently with changing climates and milder winters, the ticks are not dying off. Coupled with the strength and resistance of the ticks, the dogs of the Transkai have been under attack. My world is changing. Summers seem hotter. I no longer fear the frost. The natural balance is tipping. I am not as strong as my ancestors were. And what happened was, like years ago, is uh, the government appointed people to be in charge of the dipping tanks. So all up and down the wild coast here, they're dipping tanks for the cattle. Those dipping tanks are to maintain the animals. It's government run and everything. And then what happens is they started putting, they put schools in here. And they took the, the guys that were doing the dipping, they took, the, controlling the tanks, they took them out and put them in the security guards at the schools. And they gave the communities the responsibility for looking after the dipping tanks. Dipping is a specialized thing. You've got to have your quantities perfect. Your German precision, you know, you can't be playing with thousands of liters of water and putting in not enough dip because then it just doesn't kill the animal and the thing doesn't die and it becomes immune to it. So all these dipping tanks that are running around here, they've put, not intentionally, just through knowledge and experience and quantities and that kind of stuff, they haven't done it correctly. So the dipping isn't working. So the ticks that were dying before aren't dying anymore. When Richard Norton moved to the Transkai recently, he started the Transkai Dog Rehabilitation Project based in Port St. John's. The project is a grassroots non-profit organization that is doing what it can to help alleviate the overwhelmingly tough conditions that dogs in the area have to face. I started this initiative down here a while back because anybody who comes from a first world environment like I have wanted to go to the bush and find the peace of the beautiful bush and everything. And you come down to the Transkai and you see the state of the animals. You, you drive on the roads, your first perception is as you're driving down the road you're seeing dead dogs. And you look at this and you say, my goodness, you know, where's this stemming from? Then you live here and you start understanding what's transpiring and what's happening in the communities. And I felt something needed to happen, something needed to be done. I learned so much from the communities. 
they love their dogs. They actually love their dogs, but they don't have the resources to be able to deal with it. When we go into the community, we need to be able to inject the dogs, uh, deworm them, provide the very basic services that, that, that these guys are requiring, you know, to be able to look after their dogs. But more importantly, to be able to show them that more is not better, less is better. When they visit the surrounding areas, they try to educate the locals about the value of food and water, sterilization and general animal care to empower the locals with enough knowledge to improve their own dogs' lives. As part of a broader plan to spread this project throughout the Transkei, Richard has approached the municipality, the SPCA and local vets believing that the best route to success is through cooperation. When he met with the Port St. John's municipality manager, he discovered that they have plans to build a pound in the area to support the growing number of abandoned, injured, malnourished and sick animals. He believes that his project will work side by side with the municipal pound, but maintains that he provides community support rather than impounding the dogs. Firstly, we would love to say we appreciate what Richard is doing. When he came, he came and introduced himself to the municipality and came to my department. So his program and project is helping a lot because people now, we see a lot of people coming for, with their dogs for immunization and all that. So it's, it's a relief on its own because in the meantime that we don't have the pound, at least there's something that's happening. Working with local people from the community is the most important thing. It is absolutely vital. And um, in Victor, I've managed, well, not me, but um, I'd, I'd say the universe sent me along Victor because he, he, he's grown up in this community. He's an educated person. He's a thinking person, and he, he really does love animals. It's incredible to see him with animals. Yeah, I, I love the dogs. I can't tell you that. I'm tipping the dogs. I'm giving the dogs the D1 pill. I'm trying to give the injection for the mange. Yeah, I try to make the different difference, but it's, yeah, it can be take longer. The people is not understand it. Yeah, but they are like to keep the animals, but they are not look after. Please help me because others I not have anything for for a treatment of dogs. That video it's all right for me for my dogs because I have a, 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 a sharp dogs now because of this guy. You've got to be very careful of your perceptions. So you need to keep an open mind with what you're doing all the time. And these wonderful people, indigenous people down here. You learn all the time from them. You need to work with them, not for them. The project services a wide area. Distances between communities and rural villages spread across the hillsides can create difficulties in gaining access. I use the motorbike. Yeah, the Skorokoro motorbike. <laughs> 
because it's not good. But I try to go to find the, to go to the communities. But the motorbikes is quite old. Sometimes it leaves me on the way. Do you know? I call my uh, Richard to come to pick me sometimes. You know. So I'm still doing well now, but my motorbike is old. They need to give me a chance to do what I'm doing, to dip the dogs, to inject the dogs for the mange, and then you must sterilize them, uh, the dogs, especially the males. It's too much males in the lallies, in our communities. So it now it's spreading the, the disease. I spoke to the people. I said, hey, it's not good to keep the dogs. It's got a disease uh, around. Uh, our children, because that is going to affect our children. The locals say they don't like to have their dogs' balls cut off, because the more dogs they got, the better they are. And in a way, it's a catch-22, because they get neglected because there's too many. And the females have a hard time, because as soon as they come on heat, there's about 50 dogs running after them. Change is constant. I know this. I see the challenges that life throws you. But my place in your world can help you. I am here. I can do so much. A dog's place is by his master's side. They go and hunt and with their dogs, and the dogs help to the hunt. But the dog is not allowed to destroy that animal because the do these people need that meat. My ancestors spoke of times where game was plentiful and the hunt successful. Today we travel far, run longer. I am not sure what we're looking for anymore. We find the scent, we find the spoor, but nothing. They go watch dogs, you know, they're territorial. But they've got teeth like razors and they can be the most aggressive creature on earth. <laughs> When he says, you're not coming here, you know you're not coming there, otherwise you better have a big stick. Uh, they're very, very loyal, absolutely loyal. Uh, that comes also from their background, because uh, the black people, again, we're talking about remote rural areas, don't tie up their dogs. If the dog doesn't stay with them, that's fine. He just disappeared, never to come back. So the bond must be very strong to stay around the homestead. If the puppies at the seven or eight week of age disappear, I'm sorry, it's very harsh, but they just disappear because they don't have this bond to the people. They have to bond naturally because it's not like our modern breeds and us people that cuddle them and fancy them and overpower them. These dogs are just there. They're part of the environment. They're part of the picture. Any household can take on an Afrikaner as long as the dog, and I think it's the essential, and that's even in anybody who takes on a dog. But the essential is that the Afrikaner belongs to the family. Dogs in these far-off rural areas are for the large part being neglected. The relationship between dogs and their owners seems to have changed significantly over the years. Not all the dogs are lucky enough to be part of a household that offers them regular food or water. The bond which is so important has not been developed. These dogs are forced to become self-dependent. They scavenge, they roam the hills, and needless to say, they encounter problems. They risk being killed by cars on the roads. 
poisoned if they are suspected of stealing chickens or injuring goats. They mate indiscriminately, and thus the cycle is perpetuated. All our lifestyle has been revolving around uh, human beings and animals being friends. To us it was practical when you say, the dog, your best friend. The changes now that are taking place, we, don't, we no longer see that closeness of people to, to animals. Hence, they are roaming around the streets. So you, you, you know that the reason for them to be in that street is because they are hungry. No one is giving them love. No, because the dog loves to be loved, because it retains that love. The boss is asking me, why always the dog is, is following you? you know? I said, no, just because I love the dogs. Better than I love you. you know? <laughs> if you don't, like the, you don't love the animals, uh, real love, they can't bring you the love. But if you do the real, it can love you. Even I'm walking around in the communities, the dogs has come to me, the people there say, hey, run, you mustn't leave this dog to come to you because they are biting. But they are come to me, they, they are making their friends. I think what we'll do is we'll work as far as we can, as far as our resources will allow us. Because this is a pilot project, we are learning the most effective ways to be able to do it in a cost-effective manner. So um, if we can replicate this project in, uh, Transkai is a third world country, you know, it's, it's really going through that development stage and working with animal welfare in a third world environment like this, especially a rural environment, needs different kinds of, different set of rules to be able to deal with the situation. So we will work as much as we possibly can with the resources we have and if we can replicate and if what, what we have learned and do that in the next town further down, the, the next town further up, that will be the goal. We have to change the, the goalpost. Traditionally it will change, it might not stay all the time, but if we want to keep them uh, existing, they will have to find a new use for them. Not chewing be a pet, um, that's okay, but that's not all of it. Most important would be to have any modern application in, in a working situation. Yeah, and they have a color and it's my water and it's danger. Zabo and then Nabo is over town. And it's a Flonipa in Jayako, Nayo is of Flonip. Be my master. Make the right choice. For our journey together is inevitable. <laughs>